let's come before the Lord this is uh, Jason Burns and hope you're okay today and it's good to be with you and uh, sharing with you um, biblical ministry today and I hope this is a blessing to you let's come before the Lord Father God we come before you today we confess all our failures acknowledge the weakness of our own hearts and we acknowledge oh God how much we need you today how much we need your grace and your love and Father God we give you the prayers and the glory today and Father we pray as we look at your word today that you bless us and encourage us and give us strength we ask this Lord in your name for your glory and may this message or these messages be a blessing uh, to you and an encouragement to you we ask this Lord in your name and for your glory Amen. Okay, I, I've done these messages before and they were called the Bearing Fruit in Gospel Ministry and uh, the Fight in Gospel Ministry, but I've renamed it um, I've renamed it, it uh, The Reformed Pastor because it, there's a famous book written by Richard Baxter, a Puritan, called The Reformed Pastor. And I hope that you go and read that book and as a minister, uh, as a Christian worker, and I hope that it's a blessing to you and I hope that the whole Reformed tradition of the Puritans and the Reformers that you'll read and study and that will encourage you in your ministry and in your walk with God. Um, So the first thing in our ministry, um, in the ministry of pastoring and in the ministry of preaching, is that we keep in focus Christ, that he is the center of everything. In John chapter 1 verse 1 it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Christ is the vine, Christ is the one who is central. central. And we cannot really preach unless we put Christ at the center. If you turn to um, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would but if you be led of the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication and cleanness lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envyings murders drunkenness revelings and such like of which I tell you there are times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such things there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust if we live in the spirit let us walk in the spirit let us not desire a vain glory provoking one another envy one another why have I quoted that it's significant because uh, Paul is talking about the Christian should walk and demonstrate the Christian character so often we can be led astray for whatever reason, uh, for in our own private life or in public life or whatever, where we lose sight of the main thing that is to focus on Christ and on living for Him. If you turn to John chapter 6, John uh, chapter 6 verse 53 then Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him as the living Father have sent me I live by the Father 
so that so he that eateth me he, he shall live by me this is the bread which came down from ever not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead he that eateth of the bread shall live forever in other words as we to Christ and trust in him that is the center of our ministry that we're we're feeding on him as pastors as preachers as ministers of the gospel we're living on Christ we're feeding on Christ like I said we can eat we can easily get astray and feed on controversy rather than feed on Christ And the first thing to notice is that if we focus on Christ, it brings, he brings life, he brings renewal. Let's turn to John uh, chapter, chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 1. There are many one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God if we focus on Christ we're focusing on the word verse 4 in him was life and the life was the light of men if we focus on Christ we're focused in on the light verse 5 and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not if you turn to John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 Christ is God the word is God Christ is God if you turn to John chapter 1 verse 4 Christ is life if you turn to John chapter 1 verse 5 Christ is light if you turn to John chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 we read Jesus said unto unto them fill the water pots with water and they filled up to the brim and he said unto them draw draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they bore it Christ when we're focusing on him he brings life you see he's the light he's the life he brings quenching to our spiritual thirst let us turn to John chapter 4 verse 13 and 14 Jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again but Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's turn to John chapter 6 verse 5, and then we'll bring this home a little bit. John chapter 6 verse 5. And this said, he goes on in verse 6, and, and he said to prove him, for he himself knew what 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little one of his disciples Andrew Simon Peter's brother said unto him there is a lad here which have five barley loaves and two small fishes but what are they among so many and Jesus said make the men sit down now there was much grass in the place so that the men sat down in a number about five thousand and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed to the disciples and the, the disciples to them that were set down and likewise the fish fishes are much as much as they would when they were filled he said unto his disciples gather up the fragments and remain that nothing be lost Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, That is the truth in this world. But did you notice, my friend, every time people meet with Christ, he brings life. He brought, he says, he'll quench the thirst. Here, he just makes bread and fish overflow out of a little and so often as a pastor so often as a preacher so often as a Christian worker so often we can fo focus on the negativity we can get tired often as a pastor you'll be preaching and there's very little response to your messages 
often as a Christian worker you can be beleaguered by opposition. In fact, you can be so beleaguered that you have the wind knocked out of you. And it's in those times when we feel barren, when we feel weak, when we feel we can't go forward, it's at those times we need to focus on Christ more than we've ever done. And as we focus on Him, He begins to bring new life revive us and refresh us, even though there might not be as many conversions as we'd like, even though people don't seem to be responding to the Word of God, even though there is intense opposition, it doesn't matter because you begin to find that as you focus on Christ, within you wells up the springs of eternal water, eternal glories, eternal strength, and you get a peace and a joy that the world cannot take away from you. You get renewal within your ministry. You get strength within what God has called you to do. In other words, focus on Christ, not on the problems. How much in your ministry have you been focusing on the problem? Better to focus more on Christ. Yeah. And the wonderful thing is, my friend, there is a reason why he wants you to focus on him. As a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, your great job is to preach the word of God. But the Word of God is not an end in itself. It is to reveal Christ. But if you do not know Christ yourself, if you are not walking in unity and closeness with Him, then your messages will not have the power. You see, my friend, as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, God requires and wants of you one thing, and that is intimacy with Him. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 43 and 50. Turn to John chapter 1. Forty-three and 50. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and, he feel in, and, in, and find a Philip and said unto him, Follow me. You see, the Lord wants... wants Intimacy with Philip, follow me. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. But the third day, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is drawn aside by Christ. He wants Nicodemus to be intimate with him, to know that it's not about religion, but about being born again of the Holy Spirit. If you turn to John chapter 4, verse 9 and 13. John chapter verse 9 to 13 then said the woman Samaritan unto him how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me which am a woman of Samaria for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans Jesus answered and said unto her if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that said to thee give me to drink thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water the woman said unto him sir thou hast nothing to draw with the well is deep from whence thou hast the living water, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank therein himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh the same, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Do you see our Lord meets this woman at the well and he's inviting her to intimacy with him. He is the well, the spiritual well that she needs. And we could go on and on and on and look at many, many scriptures. If you look at two Peter, John chapter 21, verse 15 and 17, where, where 
the Lord meets with Peter and wants to restore him. You see, too often in ministry we can be busy. Too often in ministry we can be busy and busy and busy and busy. And really, we lose the intimacy with Christ. Ministry is just becoming a rotor. We can be so immersed in theology books, reading apologetics big theological tombs that we forget what it's all about it's about intimacy with Christ we can be so enamored with the prestige that we have as ministers or pastors because people respect us or whatever but it's not about that it's about intimacy with Christ we can be so bogged down with controversies both nationally and locally because things are so bad but we forget that it's all about intimacy with Christ we can have problems at home and we can have problems in the church and yet we forget that it's all about intimacy with Christ. And the one thing that God wants for you most of all is that you have an intimate relationship with him. One writer says, I don't agree with all his theology, but Archbishop Temple said, apart from him, I can do nothing. All fruit that I ever have been or can bear comes wholly from his life within me. If you're going to be effective in ministry, then you're going to be effective because you're intimate with Christ. And as you're intimate with Christ, the, the pulsating power of the living God and his power will begin to work through you in your ministry. But it begins with that time with Christ. It begins with the with dwelling with Christ. So what we've looked at so far is gospel ministry, being a pastor means focusing on Christ. It means focusing on our relationship with him. Because without that, we can't do anything. But then it's also to be realistic, to realize as a, as a pastor, as a minister, as a preacher, to realize that there will be persecution in the ministry. William Tyndale translated the Bible into English, uh, 1492 to 1538. He was strangled to death. John Bunyan, a Puritan preacher, was put in prison. Charles Simeon, an Anglican minister, was locked out of his own church in Cambridge in 1759 to 1835. There will be persecution if you're a gospel minister. Make no bones about it. You have to realize as a preacher, as a minister, you will be persecuted. In John 15:18. Hated me before it aided you. If you if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hate of you. Remember the word that I said unto you: the servant is not greater than the Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep your saying. But all these things they will do unto you. For my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If you follow Christ as a preacher of the gospel, even as a Christian, you're going to be persecuted. In John chapter 8, verse 59, they tried to stone Jesus. <coughs> John 8, 59. They took up stones to cast at him himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And you as a pastor and a minister, you're, you're upset because of the persecution as a pastor. Why isn't the congregation being a blessing to you as it should? Why are you getting the backlash that you're getting? Well, Jesus was the best person ever lived, and yet they wanted to stone him. You turn to John chapter 9, 16. 
Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Lord's time, mocked him, disagreed with him, were his enemies. John 11 verse 8. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to storm thee. Again, in chapter 11, 47, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we, for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation their Pharisees are plotting against him then we have in Jude uh, in uh, John 13 27 and after the top the sop Satan entered into him and then said Jesus Jesus said unto him thou doest do quickly for some of them for because Judas had the bag that Jesus said unto him buy those things that we have need of the feast or that we should give something to the poor he then having received the sop went immediately out and he just went and betrayed Jesus we have in John 19 15 John 19 15 but they cried out away with him crucify him the crowd were against Jesus John 19 verse 1 then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him he was whipped and then John 19 34 but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side forth and came forth out blood and water my friend as a Pete as a pastor as a preacher you're going to be persecuted you're going to be persecuted you mustn't be surprised at the attacks in your ministry you mustn't be surprised at the opposition of your ministry. That is part of being a minister. It's part of being a servant of God. You will have... Leonard Ravenhill said, If a Christian is not having tribulation in the world, there is something wrong. Thomas Watson said, Religion will cost us the tears of repentance and the blood of persecution you turn to Romans 8 17 Romans 8 17 and if the children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ so be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together we're going to suffer 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 and 16 Beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is is to try as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You see, persecution comes to those who wish to sow the seed and preach the gospel. Some will fall away because of this persecution. If you read Matthew chapter 13, 20, 21, it talks about the falling of the way. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, 29. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 For unto us it is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake 
So don't be discouraged. Stand fast. If you turn to 1 Thessalonians 3, 3. It says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed therein. Do not be put off by it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4.16 2 Corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is being renewed by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that God will be with us in our suffering that God will be with us and comfort us in John 15 verse 2 John 15 verse 2 every branch of me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth that it may bring forth more fruit <clears throat> that God will use your suffering to help you grow as a Christian he will use it to build you up and strengthen you if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 and 5 blessed be the God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we ourselves are comforted of God God will comfort you in your tribulation so that you can be a comfort to other people Bishop J.C. Ryle says trial to speak plainly is the instrument by which our faith in heaven makes Christians more holy God uses trials and persecution to make us into better people. The responsibilities of being a minister is and a preacher is to remember, like we've already said, to focus on Christ, to realize it's about intimacy, to realize there is persecution in the ministry but then realize what your main calling is your main calling is to preach you're there to preach the Word of God first of all we preach with our life let's turn to Ephesians 5 25 33 Ephesians 5 23 33 Ephesians uh, 525 husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave him sacrifice and cleanse it with washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself of glorious church etc as as pastors we and preachers we preach by the way we live how do we treat our kids? How do we treat our wives? How do we treat our families? And there is grace for those who have failed. But we preach by how we treat those around us. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. One Corinthians 13. So I speak with the tongues of man and of angels and have not charity I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity I'm nothing though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity it profited me nothing Char charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envy if not, charity vaunted not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, 
seeketh not a wrong, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but where there is prophecies, they shall fail, where there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abide of faith, hope, and charity, these, these, three, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. And we need to have that heart of God in our ministry of God's love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 and 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is of for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved is if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So, first of all, we preach with our lives, but then we preach the gospel in John 15, 27. John 15, 27. And you also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The disciples were to bear witness to, uh, of Christ, were to show forth Christ. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to 24. One Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen to twenty-four says, "For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world?" For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Greeks' foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul was to preach the gospel he was to preach Christ, he was to preach a crucified Christ, he was to preach the gospel. If you turn to Galatians uh, chapter 1 verse 6 and 9. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 and 9. says, I marvel that you are, not, you are so soon removed from him that called you into an... So... so Remove from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. We said before, so say it, any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Paul preached the gospel. He never compromised on it, but he preached it. Too often today, 
people are compromising as ministers on preaching the gospel they will not preach the whole counsel of God in the gospel they will not preach about the wrath of God on sin they will not preach the holiness of God they will not preach the need to repent and turn away from sin they will not preach on the cross they want to get into clever apologetics or they want to talk about psychology and, and all the rest of it but they put in things and don't preach the cross of Christ they'll even not even preach they'll put on drama or they'll put on films or they'll, they'll put on worship and all the rest of it but very few ministers these days will actually preach the gospel will get up and give a 35 minute for the crucifixion of Christ and say come to believe in Christ it is the only way to be saved and so we're compromising on the gospel if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 20 and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us what the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors of Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God did you get that is a minister an ambassador of God now if an ambassador is sent on a mission the ambassador has to take the message of the leadership of the city of the leadership of the of the nation the ambassador cannot change the message so often today we forget as ministers that we're ambassadors of God and we dare not change the message it's his message but so often today ministers dare tamper with the message they try to dumb the message down they try to make a new message that is not the Christian message of the gospel and so they are failing and causing shipwreck within their own faith and the faith of many because they will not preach the crucifixion of Christ they will not be ambassadors of God and plainly declare what God has said so we need to our life we need to preach the gospel clearly and uncompromisingly but we need to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit we cannot do this without his aid if you turn to John 15 26 turn to John 15 26 but when the comfort, comforter is come whom I send unto you from the Father even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father he shall testify of me this work that we do as ministers this work that we do as preachers or whatever ministry that we have this work is done in the aid and power of the Holy Spirit it is God's work and God equips for us to do this work and the equipment is the Holy Spirit if we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 verse 5 for our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and the Holy Ghost in much assurance as you know the manner of men we were among you for your sake you see when they preached it came in the demonstration of the spirit and of power and there are my friend as a reformed pastor or as a pastor or a, as a preacher let me tell you something there is the Holy Spirit and he anoints preachers if you don't believe me read Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones book preaching and preachers and read the last chapter too often as pastors and preachers we're preaching and not expecting the work of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit will do a work through your preaching he will anoint you and give you power in your preaching if you don't know anything of this power there is something wrong with you for God gives it to those who want to 
who are called to preach the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You can't force God's hand here. He will give the Spirit in measure as he sees fit. But you can be expectant to expect the Holy Spirit to give you power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, but that you should be not be grieved, but that you might know the love that I have. Sorry, I'm, um, wrong passage there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now I want to just say a little thing here, which is very important. I am a great believer in apologetics. Uh, the last few years I've spent quite a bit of time reading apologetics. And it's been a great blessing. I need to get back to reading more theology. It's been a great blessing, a great help. And it's been a great equipment in, in talking to people to be able to know various answers to questions etc but it, it is absolutely fatal in preaching if we rely on the intellect and not the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is the one that do his work I'm not saying that ministers shouldn't study apologetic books by all means but never put your trust in that. Put your trust in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the message that He is giving you to preach. Trust in God and the equipment that He has given you. One writer says we need bold, biblical, Christ centered preaching in our day. That is anointed preaching. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. John MacArthur says, according to scripture, virtually everything that truly qualifies a person for leadership is directly related to character. It is not about style or stature, personal charisma, clout or worldly measurements of success. Integrity is the main issue that makes the difference between good leaders and bad ones. At the end of the day, we have to be focused on Christ and be intimate with him. As we are intimate with him and live close with him and live a Christ-like life, we preach with our life, we preach the gospel clearly and uncompromisingly, and we preach in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power. But at all times we are focused in our lives and in our ministry on Christ. He says, I am the way, truth, I, sorry, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. Okay, we're just going to have a break for one minute. Um, I'm just going to go and get a drink of water. So I'll have a break for a minute. We're closing prayer here. So go and make yourself a cup of tea. And we're back for the second session. We're going to look at the fight in gospel ministry and as a reformed pastor how we deal with the battle in ministry and I hope this is going to be a blessing to you so let's come before the Lord Lord we thank you for your word Lord we're reminded today that we have to get close to you that, that we have to draw near to you that we have to know your heart know your strength and as we do that Lord then we're equipped and we're, we're strengthened to serve you to live for you and so, Father God, we thank you for this day and for your love and for your grace and your blessings and your care. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. And so, Father, we praise you and thank you this day. 
We pray that this message would be a blessing to those who hear it and an encouragement to them in their ministry. May they be biblical in their work. Maybe they found it found. Maybe uh, may they continue to walk with you and be encouraged in their ministry and strengthened in their ministry. We ask this, Father, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. I'm going to get a drink of water. I'll be back in a minute and continue the next session. Thank you for listening. Okay. We're in our second section of this uh, of this long message. It's in two parts. We looked at fruit. It was really bearing fruit in gospel ministry. And basically, we were looking at just a recap to make sure that we focused on Christ because he wants to be intimate with us. That we focused on preaching with our life and then preaching the gospel and in the spirit. Those are some of the things that we looked at in that session. In this session, we're looking at the fight in gospel ministry. So let's come before the Lord. Father God, we come before you today. And Father, this message I just pray for anointing and strength and help. I pray, Father, that it would be a great blessing upon people. And I pray this whole video would be used by many people, ministers, pastors, preachers, and servants of the Lord, and anybody who needs to be encouraged in ministry. Father, I just pray that you would take this video and use it for your glory to be a blessing to many, many people. And I ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay. I want to just say that in this passage, in this next part, we're looking at the fight in gospel ministry. We're, we're, we're looking at the fact that we're in a great battle. We need to get this in, in perspective. We need to get this in, in our mind. The people are going to go to hell if they don't believe in Jesus. And you as a gospel minister are going to be preaching to these people. And, and it all depends on your preaching. If they don't hear the gospel clearly, if they don't hear 
you telling them about Jesus, then they're not going to hear the message. If they don't hear the message, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to be born again. And as you preach and as you serve the God, there are spiritual wicked forces in heavenly high places that are coming to attack you and bring you down. And this is a ferocious battle because this battle, the enemies are out to destroy you. So you cannot go into the gospel ministry naive. It's, it's kind of like a young man in the Second World War joins the British Army. And it's just before D-Day. And the young man thinks he's going to be a doddle. He thinks he's going to go and have a bit of a holiday in France. And when he gets there and he gets off the boat and he, his regiment lands on the beach and all the bullets come flying and the bombs come off, come flying and he stands on a mine, his friends stand on a mine and he sees people getting blown up near him, he realizes that it was not going, it's not a holiday. That he's in the midst of a war and he's in the midst of a big battle. And it's the same with us as gospel ministers and preachers of the word. As we serve God, we're in an awesome battle, and uh, we, so often we, we're naive as to the ferociousness of the enemy, as to the, the fight. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. Paul had to battle. Now, we don't battle with weapons, we don't battle with with violence. We don't battle the way the world battles. We battle in the way God wants us to battle. That is with the Word of God. But jo Doug General Douglas MacArthur said it is fatal to enter any war without the will to win it. You cannot enter the gospel ministry without a desire to want to win. What that means is that we're out to save souls, we're out to get people saved, we're not going to be defeated by the enemies no matter what they do. So you've got to be strong. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 you've got to make it in your mind that you're going to be strong. If you don't do that you'll be taken down as a minister. You'll be taken down as a servant of God. You'll be broken into a thousand pieces and left in the dirt because you did not enter the battle realizing that you had to be strong. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You've got to be strong in the Lord. You've got to get into, the, into God and get strong in him. If a bishop tells you that you shouldn't be preaching if a, a local ministers fraternal and you go there and most of the ministers are liberal and don't believe in the Bible and they shun you you got to be strong you got strong in the power of his might Ephesians 6 10 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You've got to be strong. You can't be intimidated by a bishop who may look down at you because he thinks you're sound in the faith and he's a liberal and he is feeling antagonistic towards you because he knows that he should be preaching the Bible as the Word of God and he hasn't been doing it. You should not be intimidated by local ministers who do not believe the word of God. How dare they intimidate you? Who are they to intimidate you, a man of God who is standing on the word of God and believes it as the word of God? Be strong in the word. Be strong in your God. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The enemies of God are railing against ministers of the gospel. They are coming against the ministers of gospel and trying to intimidate the ministers of the gospel. You must be strong in the Lord. 
and resist the opposition. For you are there set before the people in your local congregation by God to do a work. And whatever opposition comes to you, God commands you to be strong. Paul, Romans chapter 1, 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God up for salvation for everyone who believes. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. So often in major denominations, Orthodox ministers will tiptoe around and almost be that they're orthodox, that they are evangelical, that they believe the Bible is the word of God. Ministers today in the climate of the church are scared to be bold for the gospel because, oh, we don't do that now, minister. We're, we're into the emergent church. We're, we're into postmodernism now, minister. We're trying new ways to do church, minister. We want children's services, minister. We don't want your preaching, minister. We've got new moralities coming in that the government's put in, and we want to put it in our church, minister. We, we, we're not into that anymore. It's out of date. We don't want the this word preached to us anymore. And so the ministers, the preachers of the word, are, are intimidated by this secular culture and the secularization within the church. And ministers are tiptoeing and they're ashamed to preach. And many of the retired ministers who have preached the word of God faithfully are made to seem as made to be seen as if they're dinosaurs. And what is happening, my friends? We have we are listening. We are listening. We are listening to the Philistines. Yeah? We are listening to the Philistines who were taken away. Our heritage, you were taking away the glory of God. We are listening to them. And so, old ministers who preach the word, rise up and be strong and do not be ashamed. God called you to preach the word of God. And even though you are a retired minister, you have a wealth of experience and you must give it to the church and you must preach the word of God. And if you're a young minister today and you've gone into the ministry, whether it be the Anglican, the Methodist or the Baptist and your local superior officer, whether it be a bishop or a superintendent, looks down on you because you're an evangelical. Dare not be intimidated by your bishop or by any of your area reps. If they are liberal, you be proud in the God of your Bible and in the word of God and in the gospel. Proud in a humble sense, if you know what I mean. Do not let the Philistines put you down. Do not let the Philistines make you feel timid. There is only one God. There is only one gospel. It is the only way to be saved. And if all the bishops stand against you and say that it is not the gospel, then you stand against all the bishops. If all the superintendents in the Baptist denomination say the Bible is not the word of God, you as a minister will stand against them because God stands with you. And one man is a majority against a thousand bishops or a thousand ministers who are liberal. You stand for God against the Philistines. You sound an alarm for truth. You proclaim the word of God fearlessly no matter what comes against you. Stop tiptoeing around your denomination. Stop tiptoeing around your church as a minister. Preach the word of God for the glory of God. I say to you, do it. They are not going to pat you on the back. They're not going to say our minister is bold for Jesus. I am not telling you to go out and cause problems against your bishops. I am not calling you to to have problems with your area reps. I am not doing that. I am telling you in the name of God, you be not ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed of Christ. Do not be intimidated by the enemies of God. Do not be intimidated by the Philistines. Do not be intimidated by them. They may throw you to the lions, 
They may throw you in prison. They may take away your ministry. They may kick you out of your manse. They may take away your salary. They may de destroy your reputation. But at the end of the day, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. And at the end of the day, you are called by God and God is with you and you have a responsibility to proclaim that word and stop tiptoeing around everybody and be bold for Jesus. Amen. That goes for the Calvinist. That goes for the Arminian. That goes for the Charismatic. You are all called to preach the word of God. You get back into that pulpit and stop being intimidated by the liberals. Stop being intimidated by the secular culture. Stop being intimidated by the Philistines who don't want your preaching. And you preach it. You get back into that pulpit and you lift the voice for Jesus and you lift it and you preach it, okay? You preach it and you never be intimidated again. I don't say go around cocky. I don't say go around thinking you're something because you're nothing. I say go around and don't be ashamed of your faith. Don't be ashamed of your Lord. Don't be ashamed of the word of God, yeah? You preach it, my friend. Never let a bishop put you down. Never let a superintendent put you down. Never let any congregation put you down if they don't believe the word of God. If they don't believe it on them, you stand there and you're a servant of the living God and you have to preach his message. Yeah? So you get up there and you preach. When you're, you students in the seminaries, and you're hearing your seminary professors ripping into the Bible because they don't believe in inerrancy. And they try to make you look stupid. And you have students in your seminary that are not evangelical laughing and mocking you. You don't have your head down as if it's shame. No, you hold your head up high because you are a servant of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation unto everyone who believes and every theological student who's been intimidated by seminary professors who couldn't preach if they tried, but they are clever and they have these clever ideas and they attack the Bible and try to make you look stupid. Don't you be intimidated as a what can say just because they can quote Derrida just because they can quote feminist theologians just because they can quote the latest th philosophical fashion so what it ain't going to save a soul it's only gospel it's only Christ crucified it's only him dying on a cross and shedding his blood for our sin it's only him that will save us and that's the only message that the church needs Christ crucified a 10-year-old boy could preach it. You don't need a theological education at the end of the day. It's helpful. I've got one. My friends have one. I'm not against it. But don't be taken in by your seminary professors who think that their knowledge is what you need. You need to learn from what you can from them. But at the end of the day, if they turn that knowledge against the gospel, then you stand with the gospel and you don't be ashamed. Amen. It's time you stop being ashamed. It's time you started be, being bold for Jesus. The Philistines have come in. How dare they come in and make you intimidated as a minister of the gospel? Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? We stand with the living God. That's who we stand with. And he's with us and he will give us strength and power and he will give us hope and he will give us peace and he will look after us and he will be with us. Who are these seminary professors? Who are these bishops? Who are these superintendents who will come and stand against our God? Who are they? They're nothing. Their ideas and opinions will be out of date within 10 years. Our gospel will always be up to date and a living God and bring salvation to souls. Amen. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. 
Come on now, get your Bibles out. You Reformed preachers out there, get your Bible out and let's get into the Word of God, eh? You pastors out there, you Christians out there, you get your Bible out, let's get into the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yeah? God not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. Stop worrying about your insecurities. Stop worrying about what people will think of you as a minister. Stop worrying about your reputation as a minister. Stop worrying about what people think of you. Who cares what people think of you? Worry about God and realize that God loves you, God's with you, and God is going to bless you. It doesn't matter what the enemies of God are doing to you. It don't matter what people are doing to you, saying about you, thinking about you. No, no. You look to God. You be happy in God. You be rejoicing in God. And stop being timid. Yeah? Stop being timid. Stop worrying about your insecurities and what people think about you. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12. And verse 12. Be of good courage, and let us play the man for our people and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. Let us play the man. Let us be of good courage. Oh man, my my friends, it's time for courage. It's time for courage. If ever the church needs men with courage, it is now. Joab was outnumbered. He was outnumbered. But oh, he was a man of courage. Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Come on! How big are the enemies that are against you today? How big are they? Are they big? Have they been winning? Have they been beating you up? Have they? Have they been beating you up in the church? Have they been winning? Have they desecrated your reputation? Made you look a fool in your church? Have they won? And now you fear? The Lord is the light, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? You've got God and he is your light and he is your strength and he is with you. You do not have to fear as a minister. Let them stamp your reputation to the ground. Let them win because they are fighting God. And when God sees fit at the right time, he will vindicate you, my friend. Though your reputation be in the dust, you will rise out of the ashes when God tells you, tells you you will rise. Just like a big, great um, whale maybe been pushed down by a great big ship and the ship goes and then suddenly the whale just comes swooping up and jumps out of the water so you will rise and be vindicated Haggai chapter 2 verse 4 Haggai chapter 2 verse 4 Haggai chapter 2 verse 4 Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, said the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Zechariah, the high priest. In the land, said the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Work. Be strong and work, he says. Ye not. 
Ye now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest, and be strong, O you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. You know that. You know the passage. You know the background. The work of God was in a mess. The enemies of God were triumphing. And God said, work, and I'm with you. Work, and I'm with you. Work, and I'm with you. Be strong and work, for I'm with you. Minister, work for God. Work for God. Come on. Preach the word of God. Get working for him. Preach it, brother. Come on. Keep working for him. Serve him. Preach the messages. Teach the Bible. Come on. Have a heart for your work. Be strong. Yes. Revive yourself. He's with you. God is with you. Now work for him. Build the church. Teach the word of God. Redouble your efforts. Preach the word in season and out of season. Come on now. Go for it. Work. Yes, the secular nations are getting worse and worse. Yes, the enemies of God in the nations are getting bigger and bigger. Yes, the church is, is becoming apathetic. But now God says work. Work is with you. We can turn the tide. We can see God going to bless. We can see souls going to get saved. Now, come on, work, minister. Work. Come on. Get those commentaries out. Get into your commentaries. Get into your Greek and Hebrew Testament. Come on now, minister. Come on. Get working. Get preaching. God is with you. He's going to bless you. Come on. He's going to give you strength and courage. Come on, work. Come on. Do not be disheartened, gospel preacher. Now work for him. Preach it now. Come on. Preach for the word, for the word. And do not be disheartened. Do not be discouraged. Matthew Henry said, we have no sufficient strength of our own. All our sufficiency is of God. He'll bless. Or we could go on. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 17. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that I had known and that all the Gentiles might here and I was delivered out of the mouth of lion. God stood with Paul in his ministry as he preached. My dear preacher, my dear pastor, he's standing with you right now in the ministry and he will not forsake you and he will be with you right now. Wherever you're pastoring, wherever you are preaching, he will be with you and he will supply your need and he will be with you. So preach and be strong. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 and 11. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 and 11. Have I not... Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals, for in three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go into the possession of the land with the Lord your God has given you to possess it. Joshua had marching orders. Go on. The next thing we need to do is not be fearful and then know our enemy. Understand the opposition that we face.
So we got to know our enemy. Who is the enemy? Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 12. Ephesians 6, and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. When we're in gospel ministry, the enemy is the spiritual dark forces ultimately. They're the ones that are trying to pull our ministries down, not people. People might try and do it, but it's the enemies of God behind them. General Ulysses Grant said, the art of war is simple enough. Find out where your enemy is, get all get at him as soon as you can, strike him as hard as you can and keep moving. Our enemies are spiritual. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, it's prayer. Ultimately, our battle is fought on our knees in prayer against these dark forces. We could go on. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 7 Moreover he must have a good report Is it 1 Timothy? Is it 1 Timothy? Let's just see Yeah, moreover he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil The devil's always trying to entrap us the devil controls the worldly system in 1 John chapter 5 19 his ferocious enemy 1 Peter chapter 5 8 let's turn 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is vicious and he's out to destroy your ministry. All the forces that come against us are satanic, James 4, 7. When the devil attacked the Lord, he defended himself with the word of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 and 11. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. When Satan assaulted the Lord, the Lord defended his ministry by the word of God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11. When the Spirit, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil take him up into the holy city on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charges concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
again, the devil take him up into an exceeding high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. He fought the battle, the Lord fought the battle with the word of God. But we can't underestimate the power of the enemy. We don't want to overestimate the devil. We only want to underestimate him. Corrie ten Boom said the first stop of the way to victory is to recognize the enemy. So how do we defeat the enemy? How do we defeat the demonic forces? Well, we've already looked at the importance of the word of God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And you all know this. Ephesians chapter 6 Finally my brethren verse 10 be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places wherein take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having gone your shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching therein with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Put on the whole armor of God. Did you notice there, there is no retreat. When a Roman soldier had a shield and had a sword, they were not going to retreat, they were going to advance. The armor of God is given to you for you to advance and take en enemy ground. But you have to do it on the basis of God's resources. You can't do it as a minister in your own resources. You can't do it purely on apologetics, purely on your intellect purely on your know-how. You need the spiritual wisdom and spiritual equipment of God. Now I know you know this. We can do things in the flesh and not do them in the ministry of the Word and how God wants us to do it. If you have failed, welcome to the club. If we turn to Romans chapter 13 verse 12 to 14 Romans 13, Romans 13, 12 to 14. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in cha chambering and wanderness, not in strife and saying, but ye put on, but Put ye on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let us put on Christ. We need the belt of truth. Are you feeling it? We need the belt of truth. Ephesians 6.14 We need to be willing to stand up for truth. Let's turn to Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should uh, once deliver for the saints. We contend for truth. We fit ourselves with the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6, 19. 
we have faith, the shield of faith. We need faith in the ministry. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 to 7. If we don't have faith, we're going to sink. If we don't have faith, we're going to fall. If we don't have faith, we're going to be discouraged. We need faith. Faith to believe God is with us. Faith to believe God will give us strength. Faith to believe God will vanquish our enemies. Faith. We need faith. We need faith. Hebrews 11, 7. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen. For by it elders obtained a good report. Through faith we by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear by faith Abel appeared unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts by it being dead yet speaketh yeah the whole chapter of 11 of Hebrews is by faith faith as a mustard seed can do great things Matthew 17 20 you need faith when you've sowed the seed to believe that God is going to bless it Matthew 17 20 and Jesus said unto them because of your unbelief for I verily say unto you if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed you shall say unto this mountain remove hence and yonder place and it shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible got to have faith faith is centered on Christ Galatians 2 20 faith rests on God 1 Corinthians 2 2 verse 5 faith is precious 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7 and faith is confident Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 we live by faith and not by sight 2 Corinthians 5 7 and we could go on and on faith you need faith you need to also grasp salvation if you're not in love with the gospel, if you're not in love with Christ, then what are you doing as a minister? Have you got so bogged down in reading theology books that you've lost the joy of your salvation? Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. 1 Thessalonians 5 8 but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and of the helmet for the helmet and helmet here it is the hope the hope of salvation have a good grasp of the gospel for that will give you strength then you need the armor of the Word of God you need to hide the word of God in your heart. Psalm 119 verse 11. Oh, this is a wonderful, 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 wonderful. Psalm 119 verse 11. Are you feeling your privilege, brother? Psalm 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not. The word of God is flawless, Proverbs 30, verse 5. The word of God is God breathed, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Jesus is God's word, Revelation 19, 13. The word of God brings salvation, Romans 10, 8, 9. And Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. The word of God will never, ever pass away, Matthew 24, verse 35. The word of God is to be obeyed, James 1.22, and the word of God achieves its purpose, Isaiah 55, verse 11. Let's read it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I pleased, and it shall prosper the thing wherein I sent it. My friend, as you proclaim it even if men reject it it will prosper then we're to pray then we're to pray in the spirit 
no matter how complete, says Albert Barnes, the armor, no matter how skilled we may be in the science of war, no matter how courageous we may be, we may be certain that without prayer we shall be defeated. I'll read that again. No matter how complete the armor, no matter how skilled we may be in the science of war, no matter how courageous we may be, we may be certain that what without prayer we shall be defeated. We need to be praying for each other. 1 Thessalonians 5.25 1 Thessalonians 5.25 Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5.25 Brethren, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. We need to pray in crisis. Acts 4.29 And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness that they may speak thy word. So they're praying in a crisis. They're praying as the gospel is being stopped. They pray against that. So we need to pray. We need to be wrestling in prayer. Mm, so we come to the end now. What have we talked about in this last part? We talked about the fight, not to underestimate the battle, not to be intimidated by the enemies of God, to realize that we need the armor of God, and it's so important. And we need that peace of God in Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians 6.14 Ephesians 6.14 Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And then verse 15, and your feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to walk in peace, to know that God gives us peace. That God isn't going to leave us or forsake us. And as we have peace, we will be able to stand in the midst of the storm. One writer said, no battle of any importance can be won without enthusiasm. Napoleon Bonaparte said, victory belongs to the most persevering. Winston Churchill said, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. <laughs> yeah. Reformed pastor or preacher or whoever you are today, if you're in the ministry or if you are doing ministry, whatever that is. I've given you some things to think about and I hope it's challenged and encouraged you. Now go forward in your ministry and listen to these words by John Wesley and then we'll close in prayer. He says, I want to know one thing the way to heaven and how to lay land safe on that happy shore God himself has condescend to teach the way at this very end he came from heaven and he had written it down in a book or oh, give me that book John Wesley as a pastor as a preacher You've been given a book, the Holy Bible. You are not called to give your opinions. You are not called to give your ideas. 
you are not called to bow to secular culture. You are not called to bow to the secularization of the church. You are not called to bow to the enemies. You are called to proclaim that word faithfully. You are called to proclaim all of the word, no matter how much the world might hate it. That is what you're called to do. That is what I would call a reformed pastor. A reformed pastor is a person, a man, who is faithful to the word of God, who is an ambassador of the word of God. He will not change the message because he is but will proclaim the word of God faithfully the way God wants. So preacher be encouraged you've been given a great task maybe you've been beaten up emotionally by your congregation or by your leadership team and maybe you're in bits at the moment maybe you've fallen out of the ministry maybe you've fallen into sin and left the ministry maybe people have pushed you out of the ministry Maybe you're going through a difficult time right now in the ministry. I hope this video has been a help to you. But one last thing. Preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. That is what he called you to do. So get on with it. And let devils and men scream all they want against you you're answerable to God so proclaim it for his glory and the need of all men and women boys and girls to come to know the living God thank you for listening and God bless you I'm going to close in prayer now and I think that will be my final bit today and um, I hope it's been a blessing to you. I don't think I can do any more today. I'm quite tired now after after that. It was a preach. Let's come before the Lord. Oh God, we come before you today and we're mindful of our own failure, our own sin. We acknowledge in our own areas we have made mistakes and we have done things in the flesh and we have not... And we confess that, Lord. We recognize, Lord, that ultimately you want intimacy with us. Without intimacy, we can do nothing. You want us to focus on you, not on the problems, but on you. You want us to draw close to you. You want us to bear fruit. You have given us the way to bear fruit. And you have called us to battle. You've not called us to walk timidly, but to walk boldly in the grace of God. And so God, we come before you today, realizing how desperate we are, that we need all your resources. We are reminded that without your resources, we can do nothing. And so, Father, we pray in the coming days and weeks ahead as ministers of the gospel that you would give us the resources, that you would equip us, that you would prepare us for the next phase of our ministries together. That as brothers we would stand together, we would work together, we would support each other and sisters for, the, for those who are, are doing um youth work and things like that and other ministries but for all of us who are doing ministry in whatever way we pray that we would stand together and support each other to proclaim the word of God Father forgive us our failure and our sin forgive us our weaknesses forgive us our foolish ways so Father we thank you for this day and we thank you for your grace and love a person today who hears your word with your love may they know your peace and joy and strength now may they know your help in ministry bless their ministry strengthen them enrich them and encourage them 
and be with them in all that they do. Bless them, Lord, in your name and for your glory. May many, many thousands, millions of people get saved in these coming weeks and months ahead. May our ministries be used to spread the gospel. Help us, Lord, for we are weak and frail. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I hope that's a blessing. Um, I don't think I'll be doing any more uh, tonight. So um, I think I'm going to call it a day now. And uh, I hope that's been a blessing to you. And uh, thank you for listening. And God bless you. If you want to, as a pastor, to teach your people to preach or be in ministry, then feel free to use this video or uh, mirror it on your site if you want to use it to help people to go forward in ministry. So uh, thank you for listening and God bless you.